Good evening. Welcome to the City of Lakewood's auditorium and our latest uh, installment of our Landlord Information Seminars. I'm Kevin Butler. I'm the Law Director here in Lakewood, and I'm uh, very pleased to have you join us tonight. We've got a tremendous group of speakers tonight, and I'm sure you're going to benefit from hearing from all of them. Just a few um, housekeeping items. The restrooms are out, out the door to your left, and then left again. Um, before you reach the end of the hallway, you'll see the doors for the restrooms. Um, we have recorded your attendance tonight, and that attendance goes towards your, uh, if you are in the business of applying for a landlord registration in Lakewood, it goes towards your certification that you file um, when you apply for your uh, landlord uh, registration certificate um, that you've attended one of these seminars within the last two years. Thanks for being here, uh, uh, not only for that, but just to hear from our great panel of uh, speakers. Um, and we do have lots of materials that are landlord-specific on our website, so I'd encourage you to visit onelakewood.com. Find the Landlord Resources page. You can either search at the top, or just search Landlord, um, and you can, you can also navigate your way to that from uh, the city's homepage. It's onelakewood.com. That's spelled out, O-N-E, lakewood.com. Um, we've got a great guide that previously we had in printed form. Now it's a PDF uh, to save paper and money. But it's a great landlord uh, guide. It covers everything from fair housing to uh, tenants uh, screening to, uh, which actually is an aspect of fair housing, to um, dealing with uh, problem tenants, uh, dealing with our uh, building department, police, uh, any nuisance-related issues. And so I'd encourage you to take a look through that. Um, I'm sure you're going to find it enjoyable. I have the privilege of welcoming to the lectern uh, mayor Summers. Of course, I work with the mayor daily, so it's not as if we're meeting for the first time. But what I will say is, this is the mayor's last landlord information seminar, and he began these uh, back in 2011. This is, I was, I marveled to realize this is our 22nd time doing this, which means we've spent about 40 hours, over 40 hours, uh, with landlords, uh, and you are a very important business in the city of Lakewood. That's why we started these seminars, and I give all the credit to the mayor for doing that. He's going to give you, uh, for the last time, because he's not running for re-election and his term is up at the end of the year, um, he's going to give you an overview on some things that you may find compelling, and then we're going to get into the rest of our seminar. We're going to adjourn at 8.30 formally, so our presentations will end at 8.30, and then if you'd like to stick around, um, we will uh, entertain Q&A for the next half an hour until 9 o'clock, and then we'll let everyone go. Um, if you are planning on leaving at 8.30 and not sticking around for Q&A, I would just ask you to get up and do that as quickly as you can so that we can uh, uh, begin with the Q&A um, at that point. All right? Thanks so much. Mayor Summers. Thanks, Kevin. Good evening. Good evening, landlords. So this is September 11th, and we know that's an important day in our history. I want to remind you that on our uh, fire station number one, which is at the corner of Madison and Warren, are right near there, are two steel girders that were from uh, the World Trade Center. And they are mounted as reminders to certainly our firefighters and to our community and to the rest of the world, the, the important events of that day. So make it a point uh, to, to drive by there, especially on a day like today. Uh, but I happened to be there this morning, and there were residents, uh, well, not even residents of Lakewood, but folks wandering up uh, just to sort of connect to that moment and where they were at that time. I also uh, hope you may have noticed that on the front yard of Lakewood High School were 2,977 flags. Each of those flags represents a victim from September 11th, 2001. So Lakewood, in two very important, distinguished ways, I think, tries to acknowledge the importance of the history of, of 18 years ago. And I know probably all of us remember exactly where we were that day. I want to give you an update on three major subjects, one more extensively and two briefly. First one is affordable housing. There isn't a mayor in the country who's facing the benefits of gentrification, but also the parallel challenge of creating housing uh, costs for folks in a variety of income se uh, sectors, and Lakewood is among them. I think you know, those, especially those landlords, and I think I talked to a landlord who's been a landlord for maybe 70 years, uh, 
that things ebb and flow in terms of the marketplace of, of tenants and landlords. And we're definitely in a, in a, a landlord market right now. Uh, rents are strong and uh, they are compelling and the demand is high. And I know I talk to renters regularly who find themselves with a waiting list of folks. And that's a preferred position that we, we, we want you to be in. And we want you to be in that position because we want you to be confident about your future. We want you to invest in what is likely pretty close to a 100 year old house, if not over 100 years old. And that house has served this community very well, but by virtue of its age and its design, it takes tender loving care and that takes money and dedication. And we need you to make sure you make that investment. We also know that landlords who make that investment do much better than those who don't in terms of attracting and retaining good tenants. But the downside is that because rents are rising, there are folks who are find themselves in a position to be unable to pay that rent. So what do we do about that? Because Lakewood has been very proud and benefited mightily from a great strata of income experiences in our town. I grew up here, my kids grew up here, and their friends, my classmate from Lakewood High School, Greg Jacobson, is here. Uh, we grew up in a town where our folks, uh, our, our fellow classmates uh, lived uh, in all kinds of cir circumstances, and it didn't matter to us. It just didn't matter, and that's a virtue that we want to hang on to. So how do we uh, make sure that we, we provide that variety? Well, some of you may remember that at our last landlord seminar, we invited the Cleveland Metropolitan Housing Authority to come in and educate us about vouchers. And that was actually a fairly controversial conversation. We learned there were very significant challenges to the voucher program, which is a federal subsidy to allow a lower income person to be able to pay market rents by using this voucher as a subsidy. Well, we found out there were two major problems. The vouchers didn't meet our rents. They were generally lower than our market rents. And secondly, the process by which we would take these rents uh, or these, these voucher applications were very long, sometimes a minimum of four, a maximum of eight weeks with an uncertain outcome as to whether or not uh, the, the leasehold would be uh, approved and or what the rent would be that would be offered by the voucher. And uh, council at that point in time was considering a uh, housing a voucher uh, income discrimination ordinance that would have required you as landlords to consider vouchers uh, by, and uh, that was very controversial. We engaged heavily as a co landlord community. Many of you were part of that. Council chose to withdraw that ordinance. So today uh, we, we do not have that ordinance. Some communities in our, in our region do, however, we do have many other initiatives that are important because the, the issue is still important. The strategies remain challenged. So we, we then subsequently followed up with CMHA, who is basically the local vendor for the Federal Department of Housing and Urban Development. And we began our conversation to try and close the gap on rent and to seek ways to make the inspection process more competitive. I will tell you that uh, we, while we initiated those conversations, they certainly didn't arrive at any conclusions that day. And, and frankly, I'm not particularly optimistic that we're able to get any short-term gain there. That's a major federal bureaucracy, and it's a one-size-fits-all on a national model. And what is a hyper-local strong market, Lakewood, is not necessarily representative of the metropolitan area of Cleveland. And that's how the rent averages are determined, which is a two-county average. Well, we're a little above average in our rent, so uh, that's a challenge. But we are exploring how we can use our inspectors here in Lakewood uh, to be the HUD inspectors and therefore significantly shorten and make more effective the inspection cycle. Uh, that may have more hope in the future uh, as to whether or not the voucher process can be a viable one for, for Lakewood, but I wanted you to get an update that we're working on that. Uh, we continue actually using some federal block grant money to make uh, affordable housing investments on one and two family homes. Uh, their example at 1477 Lauderdale, it's in process. There's two townhouses at the corner of Robin and Plover, and there's a rehabilitation a couple years ago at Quail and Plover, and we usually do about three a day, or three a year. And these are houses where we're able to use some of the federal housing recovery money from the Great Recession and invest in these houses uh, and, and then sell them to an income qualified buyer. In that process, there's actually a, a, a structural loss that the government takes that's, to, that's actually determined to be an element of success. So if we were to spend $200,000 to build a house and sell it to an income qualified buyer for 120, but they were lower income qualifying folks, that would be a successful outcome towards that investment. 
uh, and then uh, we would take that 120 and then reinvest it in the next project. So eventually, you run out of money. Uh, but so far, we've been able to stretch these dollars and uh, really almost eight years later are continuing to make some one to, to two investments a year to create housing options for low-income buyers. So that's important. We also uh, uh, offered uh, a, a rental restoration program. This is important for you to consider as well. Again, using some federal housing money, uh, we've offered zero interest loans up to $50,000 for a leasehold. If it's a double, it would be $25,000 per each. Uh, and it would, that loan must address kitchen and bath remodeling, electrical, plumbing, accessibility issues, and energy efficiency. Uh, we would uh, give a 30% 30, uh, 30 of the loan would be amortized over five years at 0%, and the remainder of the loan would be forgivable at year five if you then rented to a low-income person during that five-year period. So we would provide financial subsidy to you to invest in your property, and then in turn, you would use some of the savings of uh, the benefits of that savings and the, and the, the zero uh, debt costs to uh, create an incentive to take a low-income tenant. So that's a program that we've launched. We actually have two applications in process now. We're also taking some additional federal money, and we're working with two uh, more multi, larger multi-unit tenants, one at Byright and one at 13389 Madison, developing subsidized units in a multi-unit process. Now, one thing that I've learned about, subs about uh, the fact of affordable housing, in the end, if there's a gap between what the market is asking and what a low-income person can pay, if you're going to close that gap, it requires a subsidy. So who is the subsidizer? For really pretty close to 200 years, that subsidizer has been the federal government of the United States and remains so today. But we also recognized in our conversation with you landlords that you oftentimes are subsidizers. And that's an important element. And this comes about in this fashion. Oftentimes, and perhaps many of you are do this even regularly or today, if you have a tenant that has been an outstanding tenant, they've been long-term tenants in your leasehold, you know there are a little incomes challenged, and you choose not to raise the rent. That is a private market subsidy. We learn from landlords that happens frequently in Lakewood for a variety of reasons. And I will tell you that's a very good outcome. That is probably the most efficient subsidization. It's a market-driven process. It's actually at no, no cost other than uh, deferred or lost income to you, but you make that choice in terms of the quality of that tenant, the circumstances they're in, and the respect they have for your leasehold, and somehow a fair deal is recognized. That's a private market subsidy, and I know that happens in Lakewood, and I'm very grateful for that. And you should be proud of yourselves when you find yourself in that circumstance because you are contributing as well to affordable housing in Lakewood. So uh, we... Uh, we are attacking this issue of affordable housing in a variety of contexts, which you now know. It's an important element of our community, and we want to keep you abreast of it. And ultimately, I think uh, if we can close the gap between vouchers, the process, and the rent, uh, that could be, in fact, an attractive dimension under certain circumstances, but we would want you to become educated and are committed to keep you uh, abreast of that. You're probably going to be hearing a little bit more about the fair housing issues. Well, you will be hearing more later on tonight, and Peter will give you an update um, about that subject. Two final points I want to share with you. The new tax law that started in January 1, 2018, for the first time raised the standard deduction to a very significant level, $12,000. And for most Lakewood homeowners, that means you're an owner of the house and you would be owners as well, if you took your property tax plus your mortgage interest, plus any philanthropic contributions, for most folks in Lakewood, that did not exceed $12,000 for that house. So what this means is, for the first time, a renter gets the same deduction that a homeowner has. As a practical matter, what that's fueling is that they're, it's fueling the trend of being renters. There's no economic incentive, or less so anymore, other than long-term ownership and quality of life issues, but the financials situation has changed significantly. So what we're seeing is two, baby, two, two big bulges of renter populations, younger millennial folks, uh, and also empty nesters. Empty nesters who have lived in a home, perhaps elsewhere in the region, and this is very common in Lakewood, and you may be renting to some of them, 
are choosing to leave the exurbs, a big house, big car, big commute, empty house, uh, what are we doing out here? Choosing to be in a community for the same reasons as millennials, a lot of amenities, lack of walk, lock, lots of walkability and accessibility, and they're choosing to rent. And this tax law actually neutralizes any disadvantage from that choice. So for most communities, this is actually a sort of an existential threat to how homeownership exists. I look to Euclid as an example that's experiencing that right now in Parma and others. But in Lakewood, where we have 28,000 housing units, 16,000 of which are rental units, it's our DNA. We're built for this. So we, uh, we actually think this is probably a positive trend. And as landlords, I think it should be a strong one for you because it strengthens the demand for the kind of places you have. So the last point I want to make is in April of next year is Census 2020. So every decade since 1790, the United States government seeks to count its citizens. And it determines, this count determines our congressional boundaries, which states have how many represent, representatives. And probably more importantly here in Lakewood, it also is a key determinant of how many federal housing and low income dollars we get. So in Lakewood, this count is important. Um, and it's really important that we make sure everybody respond. This particular census in April of next year uh, will be the first real online census, uh, uh, a census. So it's going to be a different format. I don't really know what it is. We're seeking to understand how it's going to play out, but we're gonna need your help. And your help comes in two forms. One is to educate your tenants that there is a census, a census and that they have to and must help us and help you by responding to it. And most important thing is how many people live in your place? That's the most important thing. There's demographic information we seek, uh, income information, uh, uh, other ethnic origin, uh, racial issues that are interesting to our culture. But most importantly, we need to know how many people live in Lakewood. So we're gonna ask you, uh, as with things move along next year, to communicate with your tenants about the importance of the census, expect it, perhaps be prepared to answer questions they might have, or at least provide direction. We will provide information to you to pass on to them that will both educate them and, and inform them of how to do it. We'll have lots of resources in our community to help, but the fact of the matter is you are the only ones who know who actually lives in your buildings, in your leaseholds. We do challenge ourselves by trying to determine who should be paying taxes in this community, and we do, you might be interested to know, uh, you work with Cleveland and we uh, have a partnership that allows us to go out to the federal government, so federal returns are matched to addresses in Lakewood and we ultimately determine often a year or two later who actually lives here. But this has to happen in April 2020. It won't matter to us if we, if we learn uh, this information in July of next year. So the big count is next year, so I ask you to stand ready uh, we're going to be working with you. You will work with your tenants to make sure they understand their duty and the, and the ramifications of that. So uh, be prepared for that. So th thank you very much for your attendance tonight. And just let me know, let, let me tell you how pleased I am to have worked with you these past nine years as mayor and how grateful I am for your investment and confidence in creating great housing options for our citizens right here in Lakewood. So have a good evening. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you, Mayor. Um, one uh, note on what the mayor was talking about. In exactly two weeks' time, at 7 o'clock in this very room, folks from our community development uh, office, which oversees our use of those federal um, HUD monies, will present on that uh, rental restoration loan program that the mayor mentioned, uh, which permits you uh, to receive very affordable financing for uh, uh, improvements to your properties, um, provided that you rent to low or moderate income tenants uh, for a specified period of time. So they will present on that program right here two weeks from now, September 25, uh, at 7 p.m., all right? Um, next, I'm gonna introduce Stephanie McConaughey. She is the program manager for Environmental Public Health Services with the Cuyahoga County Board of Health, and she's gonna launch the discussion tonight uh, that we will have for the next, uh, 40 minutes or so, uh, 45 minutes, on the issue of lead, which of course is an important issue, uh, and it's certainly a very topical issue right now. Stephanie, all yours. Thanks. 
Um, and don't let Kevin scare you. I'm not talking for 40 minutes. I'm only going to talk for about 15, 20 minutes. So don't let him scare you. Um, so I just kind of want to touch on lead. I'm sure you've heard a lot about lead-based paint in the news lately with everything that's going on in the city of Cleveland and nationally. Um, Flint still rings in a lot of people's minds. So I just want to touch on lead with you all. So if you look at your home and you see paint conditions like this, you may have a lead-based paint hazard in your property that you rent. Um, so the basics, what is lead? Lead is a heavy metal and it's a very flexible metal and it's been around since the Egyptians, the Romans used it. Um, it is still used today in some um, cheaper jewelries, uh, it's been used in paints, it's been used in gasoline. Some of you here still remember when we had lead in our gasoline. Um, you can still find it in um, glazes that come from different countries, um, herbs and spices that come from different countries, you can find lead in that as well. So it's still heavily used. You cannot buy lead paint today though, okay? So don't think that you have that. It was banned in 1978. Why is lead a concern? Well, lead is predominantly a concern for children less than six years of age. Their brain is still growing and developing. And so when you introduce lead into their body, it causes neurological damage. So you can have a decrease in their lifetime IQ. You can have learning disabilities, speech delays, impaired growth, um, and behavioral problems like attention deficit disorder and hyperactivity. So these are all very common things when you have a child that has been lead poisoned. But there are no obvious symptoms of when that child is poisoned. These things show up later in life. So it's not an obvious thing like the child has a runny nose or the child has a headache. There's nothing that's very noticeable right away. So where's lead found? Lead is found in homes that were built before 1978. The older the home, the more likely you are to have lead-based paint in the home, especially if you have not made any improvements to the home yet. They're generally found in exterior surfaces, outside of windows, outside of doors, front porches, and the soil. And the soil is because we did have lead in our gasoline, and it does come off, flake off the side of the house, and so we do get into our soil as well. So we also find it in some occupational hazards. Um, which wouldn't affect you. So if you, know, you have a renter and they work in you know, construction or you know, rehab or something like that and they're bringing it home, that's not something that's going to affect you as a landlord. Um, we do find it in water. You can live safely in a home that has lead pipes or pipes that have lead solder. There are things to address those. So it's not something that we're concerned about like they are in some other communities. So the city of Cleveland's water department does do annual testing and they do report out what their lead levels are in different areas in the county, and so far the water for lead has been safe. So what happens is most children, they're going to either consume the paint directly or they're going to consume the lead dust. And it's not always a child sitting there chewing on a windowsill, picking paint off their front porch and eating it. A lot of times it is accidental. We know that small children, like I said, those children that are less than six years of age, especially in that 18 months to 36 months, spend a significant amount of time on the floor. And they also spend a lot of times putting things in their mouth, not just their hands. So their toys are on the floor, the toys are outside on the front porch or in the yard. Everything is going in their mouth, their hands are going in their mouth. So they're accidentally ingesting it. It's not intentional. So we do find that that's most of the way it's coming from. And the dust, obviously you'll see the paint chips if they fall on the floor, but the dust is something different. Like I said in the beginning, lead is a heavy metal. So it's going to fall directly onto a horizontal surface near it. So if you think about every time you open and close that window, that dust is falling down. It's, it's grinding on the windows and it's falling out on the windowsill or on the floor right in front of the window. Children like to spend a lot of time at the window looking out the window to see the world outside. They're putting their hands there. They're putting their mouth there. They're ingesting that lead dust. So we also find it, you know, when you're opening and closing those wood doors, you know, that are painted on both sides. You're opening and closing it. You're walking through it. You're tracking it in. You're walking across that front porch that's been painted a number of times, and there's a worn path right there in the front of the doorway to the steps. You're exposing those older layers of paint. You're tracking it into the house. The dog in the yard is running a worn path along the fence, chasing the next door dog. 
he's coming into the house bringing dust and dirt on his feet as well. So it's being tracked in the house by people, by pets, just by living in the home, opening and closing windows and doors. And these children are being exposed through ingesting. So, um, so again, the worst areas in the home, like I said, are those old wood windows, the front porch soils, um, the bare soil. Those areas are the worst. So this is what really affects you. How, how do you do anything to make it better? So hopefully you all, through your registration and Kevin over here, um, know that you are required to provide one of these to your tenants. If you are renting a property that was built before 1978, you should and must provide one of these to your tenants. And it's basically stating not that you have lead hazards in your home. You're not admitting to that. You're telling them there is a potential for lead hazards in the home because of the age of the home and that you want to create an open communication with that tenant to have them tell you whenever there's something that they see that's defective. But whenever you know something happens, Johnny threw the ball on the side of the house and now there's paint chipping and peeling and everything like that, you want them to have that open communication to tell you so you can fix it and address it before something happens. So you have to provide this. It's a requirement. I recommend that you put somewhere on your lease agreement that you did provide this and they sign off saying that they did receive this. This is a federal requirement. <clears throat> like I said, hopefully Kevin and his office and you know, building and housing are doing a good job providing this information to you all. Um, you want to make sure that you are keeping your home in good condition, all painted surfaces in good condition. I know currently the city has a three-year rotation on rental inspections. Five-year? Three to five-year? <laughs> Okay, so and I know that they're looking towards starting to document when they come out, you know, any chipping and peeling paint. So that's something that's in the future for the city of Lakewood to start doing when they do their rental inspections. So you want to make sure that not just before the rental inspection comes that you address any chipping and peeling paint, but that you do this on a regular basis. Um, and then if there's anything that you need to do to the home, um, they have a, a plumbing leak, you know, and the wall gets, you know, saturated or the ceiling gets saturated and you're going to do, you know, some drywall work or whatever. You want to make sure those renovations are done when there are no small children in the home or you can contain that work area so you're not potentially exposing a small child or a woman of um, pregnancy age, I should say. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, what else can you do? So... Outside, I think they were nice enough to provide all of you one of our grant flyers. So we've been very fortunate in the county uh, to have funding available to residents in Lakewood. Lakewood is one of our target communities, um, and it's based upon income. So it's not based upon your income. So if you all have a beautiful home on Lake Erie and Bratnell, good for you. Um, we're not worried about your income. We're worried about your tenant's income. So it's based upon the tenant's income. Um, to qualify. They do not necessarily have to have a child in the home because we know rental properties have um, turnover, a high turnover. So the potential to have future children in the home is great. Um, so the income is roughly 56500 for a family of four. Um, they would have to show proof of income and there, there's a whole process to do that. Um, but we can address lead hazards in the home window replacement, door replacement, exterior painting. Um, so there are a lot of things that we can and do do. It is federal money. It is a grant. So there is not a loan. So there is nothing that you have to pay back. We do work very closely with the city of Lakewood for um, those individuals that need extra assistance to, if it goes above our um, cap of $8,000, we tell them to work with you know, Lakewood Alive, the city of Lakewood, to find those additional dollars if they need assistance to make that happen. Um, if it is a two-family home, then it is $8,000 per unit. So now you're looking at $16,000. Um, so it's something to consider. It's available. Again, it is a grant, not a loan. Um, let's see. Now, Dan Lawson is from Paragon, which is a construction company. And Dan is a licensed lead abatement contractor. And I would always say... If you want to do any work in your home, hire a contractor to do the work. Make sure that it's being done and done correctly. And the ultimate is hiring a state licensed lead abatement contractor. 
They're going to do the work that meets the standards of not only the federal government, but also the state. And they're going to ensure that the cleanup was done and done properly. It costs you a lot more to hire a licensed lead abatement contractor. So at a bare minimum, I would strongly recommend that you hire a US EPA certified renovation, repair, and paint contractor. These contractors are required since 2012 if they are going to work in a pre-1978 structure to have this certification. Unfortunately, the state of Ohio has not adopted this rule. So there is no enforcement from the state, and unfortunately, the city of Lakewood cannot enforce this rule either. However, these contractors that do have the US EPA certification know how to work lead safe. They understand the risks that are involved in working in an older home with potential lead hazards. So they know how to contain the work area. They know how to clean up the work area correctly. If you are a contractor that is very actively involved in maintaining your own property, this is something to consider. It is a one day, eight hour class. Half of the class is lecture textbook. The other half is hands on. Um, and they show you how to set up containment. They show you how to properly scrape by wet scraping. They show you how to do these things. And then at the end, you take a national test. It's not a difficult test. If you paid attention in the first you know, seven and a half hours, you can pass the test at the end. Um, I'm, I'm not really sure what the cost of the class is going for now, about $300. Is that $495 for the class? If you register with the US EPA to become a certified contractor, um, it's $500. The certification is good for five years. After the five year, you take a four hour refresher course and then recertify yourself. If you're thinking about just doing this because you want to work just in your rental property, you do not have to register with the US EPA. You can take the course, get your certification if you pass the exam, and then that gives you the ability to know how to work lead safe in your property. So again, we've had a number of contractors, or I should say a number of homeowners that have chosen to do this um, so they can work on their properties or any other properties that they purchase that may be, may be questionable, maybe may that 1976, 77, 78, 79 age, and they want to make sure that they're working lead safe in them. So it's something to consider. Um, oh, and I brought a handful of these, so if you want them, um, we'll be passing them out. Correct, Shannon, at the end? Yes, so we have a handful of these. Um, so how do you, how does an R, RRP contractor, how does an abatement contractor fix these hazards? So there are a couple of options. Um, you can completely abate, which means you remove the paint hazard. So that means if it's a window, you're completely removing the window, replacing with a new window. That's never going to be a hazard again. It's completely gone, it's abated. You can take the sashes out and remove the paint from the substrate. So you can chemically strip the paint from the wood, put in sash tracks, put in a well liner, rehang the sashes, and cross your fingers that the windows still work as well as they did before you did that. So oftentimes they don't. And the labor that's involved, Dan can attest to it, the labor that's involved in doing that is about the same as just pulling a window out and putting in a new window. So um, we do recommend, though, if you do remove windows and replace, you make sure that you pull permits. If the city of Lakewood requires permits, you pull permits so you're up and up. Um, if it's something um, like a, a door, there are a couple of options with a door. Obviously, you can abate that. You can remove the door, install a new door, a new wood door, a new fiberglass door, a new aluminum door, whatever you want. Take out the whole system, the jam, the casing, the door itself. You can do all that at the threshold. Or what you can do is you can um, remove the paint. It's about a two inch strip. You're gonna remove the paint from the door panel about two inches, and then you can repaint it. You can take out the door stop, replace the door stop. You can replace the jams. You can you know, paint and cover the threshold, and you can still use that door because what you're doing is you're eliminating you know, where that door bangs against the door stop. You can also plane the edges of it so you don't have the rubbing on the header or on the jams or on the threshold. So you're re removing any impact or rubbing surface. So there are, there are ways to work around it. If you're talking about the side, the siding of your home, if you still, if your rental property still has the wood siding, 
Obviously, you can upgrade to vinyl siding if, if it's not a historic property, right, Kevin? Uh, correct. I don't know what the city of Lakewood allows and everything like that. So make sure if you can upgrade to vinyl. We have very few historical properties, I would say. Okay. That From vinyl siding. So yeah, so that's that's a huge upfront investment, and that's something you have to consider. You know, the upfront investment versus every couple of years going through wet scraping and painting the home and hiring someone to do it, because most of these homes are two to three stories and very high, and you're going to need the proper equipment to get up to those high peaks, because you can't just paint just from eye level down. You're going to have to paint the whole thing. So you have to consider what you want to do. Do you want to completely abate the problem and never have this issue again? Or are you okay with just doing you know, annual or biannual maintenance? It's your choice what you want to do. So there are options for every surface how you want to treat them. When it comes to bare soil, um, you can obviously dig out the soil and put in new soil and you eliminate the hazard. You can mulch around it. So if it's on the perimeter of the house, you can mulch there so you're creating a barrier. Um, between where the hazard is and what the child can get in contact with, or you can make it impermeable, meaning you put down concrete, you put down pea gravel, you know, and it's like six inches or something like that, so make it impermeable. So those are some options you can do with that. Um, when I talk about bare soil, a lot of people talk about gardens. We always recommend put in raised beds and bring in clean fill, bring in clean soil. So. When does it get ugly? And this is what I spoke about a couple years ago with Judge Carroll, if you were here. Um, there are instances when there is a child poisoned in the home. And this is not because the tenant wants to get back at you and they're you know, taking their kid to the doctor or they're making up stories. When we come out, it's a confirmed blood draw that the child has had that shows that they have a lead level in their blood of 10 micrograms per deciliter or higher. And they went to a doctor and the doctor did what's required by law. If they're living in a community that's considered high risk, and Lakewood is, just based upon the age of the housing stock, they are required to have the child have a blood test. So this is not something that the tenant is doing to get back at you. This is what the doctor is required to do by law. It's then reported to the health department and then we are required by law to come out and do an investigation of the property. We do not need permission from you to get into the property. The tenant can let us into the property and we can do the investigation. When we go and do the investigation, we are looking for defective paint. So we're looking for any surface that has chipping, peeling, deteriorate paint, inside, outside, and any detached structure. We are also testing what we call friction areas. So your windows, your doors, your front porches, those are surfaces that get constantly rub down and abuse from opening and closing or walking on them. So we're testing those. And we're also testing any bare soil. If we find lead-based paint present and it's in those areas and in a deteriorated condition, we will issue orders mandating that you correct those hazards. You have an initial 90 days to correct the hazards. Now, we can give up to three extensions of 90 days apiece. So technically, you have 360 days to come into compliance. Failure to do so, and trust me, we will work with you the whole time, but failure to do anything, if you blow us off, we will then issue a notice to vacate to the tenant, and we will stick a placard on your property, and we will stick it on the front door, and it is a sticker, so we do put it on. We've put it on the side of the house. We've put it on the front doors. We've put it on anywhere that's visible to the front of the property, stating that this property is unsafe, for human occupation, not just children, but for anyone. And this placard must remain on the property until the hazards are corrected. We also notify the city that we have done this, and we also put an affidavit on the property record. So there is an affidavit of fact on the property record stating that there are hazards at the property the property has placarded, has been placarded. So we cannot stop the sale of a property, but if a title company does due diligence and they do a title search, this will come up. And I've had numbers of realtors, title companies, what have you, call me and ask, what does this mean? And I explain, they can buy the property, they can't live in the property. So this is something to think about. And then we'll always, always work with you to get the property enrolled into a grant. 
so that we can spend our money, we can count a unit completed, and then you can have a lead safe property. So if this is something that looks like your property, okay, I'm almost done, promise. So if this is something that looks like your property, um, that would be cited um, for defective paint, and we would issue, if it, and it did, test positive, and this is in Lakewood, um, this would be included in the orders. There's my, my lovely placard I just showed you. See, I told you it was done. So um, I think Kevin wants to open this up to the panel to talk about anything that I talked about or anything additional in regards to lead paint. That's great. So. Thanks. Thank you, Stephanie. Yeah. Well, Stephanie ended on a high note, didn't she? Placard on your door. Um, I suspect um, what we're going to hear from our remaining panelists um, Allison Urbanic, who is with Lakewood Alive, uh, she is our, the Housing Outreach Coordinator. She's got other titles with Lakewood Alive, which is our local community development corporation. Um, and Lakewood Alive performs uh, an enormously important function in Lakewood with respect to uh, housing outreach um, altogether. That's with respect to uh, owners, tenants, and anyone else who needs to um, uh, get on top of maintaining our century-old homes. Um, Dan Lawson is the president of operations with Paragon. Uh, Stephanie mentioned uh, Dan before, and, and uh, Dan is a lead safe contractor um, who has been in Lakewood and knows uh, our city well. Uh, he certainly knows, he works hand-in-hand -hand with the Board of Health, I think, uh, on a regular basis uh, with respect to lead abatement. And so what I wanted to do is just begin a conversation tonight in the remaining time we've got, which is frankly not that long. Um, but I, I wanted to find out uh, basically what the interactions are of these three folks with our landlords in Lakewood so that you can hear. Some of you may have had personal interactions with them, um, in which case um, you may want to shed some light on how those went. Um, and certainly you're going to be free to ask questions of them, uh, time permitting. So Allison, why don't we just start with you and, and I'll ask you if you could um, to explain your role with Lakewood Alive and uh, mainly how you involve yourself with uh, this enormously important industry in Lakewood, which is our landlords. Thanks. Well, good evening. My name is Allison Urbanic. I'm the Housing and Internal Operations Director at Lakewood Alive. I've been with the organization about six years, and I eat, breathe, sleep housing. I love housing. If you ever talk to me on the phone, you know that I probably talked your ear off about whatever you called about. Uh, oftentimes, I interact with landlords or residents, owner-occupants, renters, about home repairs, uh, discussing the process, uh, how to interact with contractors, and how to ensure that you're not crying at the end of a project and that you felt like you've had a successful endeavor working with those contractors. Uh, so Lakewood Alive, as Kevin mentioned, is the community development organization for the city of Lakewood. Our mission is to foster and sustain vibrant neighborhoods, and specifically with the housing outreach program, our mission is to ensure that all residents in Lakewood are living in healthy and safe housing. So uh, in order to talk about lead and what we do, uh, we do have, <clears throat> excuse me, the Paint Lakewood program. Uh, similar to as Stephanie has talked about, the Paint Lakewood program is a program designed to uh, help tackle exterior painting and doing so in a lead safe manner. We also count tenants' income. So if anyone out there needs to get the exterior of their home painted, our program is available to you once every seven years. We try to work with you to ensure that you get a job that will last five to seven years, and we really encourage you, uh, actually you have to work with a licensed and bonded contractor as well as one that is EPA certified to uh, complete a lead safe paint job. So there are applications out on the table, or you can visit lakewoodalive.org uh, to find our application. And then again, uh, if you are working with uh, the Cuyahoga County Health Department or with the city of Lakewood, we can help you work through the process of working with contractors, finding a contractor, evaluating the estimates that you're receiving, and ensuring again that you get a job well done. Thanks for the overview, Allison. Dan, um T tell me if you could just um, uh, what your what your day to day work involves uh, around the issue of lead. 
Um, I think the easiest thing to say is that um, uh, what happens is, is what Stephanie said most, I think, is that a lot of the um, work can be done by homeowners to a certain extent, meaning preventative work that couldn't be done. But once the order has been applied to your home, then you have to see an abatement contract. Once that order has been applied to your residence, you have to see an abatement contract. So that means Jim can't come over, Tommy that works on your house can't come over, they cannot lift their order for you. They can be a licensed contractor and bonded in the city of Lakewood and any other municipality in the state of Ohio, but they cannot lift that order for you. Only a lead abatement contractor can then lift that order up because we have to give notice to the state as to when we're gonna start a project, when, they're, when we're gonna end a project, we have to get clearances in all our, in Cuyahoga County in our suburbs, the County Board of Health comes out mostly. They have a couple of um, assessors that come out, Stephanie's one of them, that comes out and takes clearances. So she has to take wipes after we're finished. So to tell you how specific that is, we actually have to have, it's usually two individuals that clean the house completely. So the house is in better shape, like Mary Maids came and cleaned it, to be quite frank with you. And we have to close all the doors and all the windows, and we no one can move. That means there's no hammering, there's no, we can't slam the doors or anything like that. Then Stephanie will show up if she's the person assigned, which we try to have as much as we can, her come out. Um, she puts on booties so she can walk into the house so that she's not tracking any contaminants from outside, and she has to do it right at the entrance of the door. So she can't stand outside the porch and put them on her. Right before she's walking in the door, she has to put them in. And then she has to take uh, a surface wipes in order to um, test them. And they go out to a testing facility. And usually we get information back within 24 hours, whether the unit passed or not. If it passed, then it's safe at that time for the occupants to then re-enter the home. If it does not pass, then we have to do another cleaning to see if it'll pass again or the house is still what we consider contaminated. That's how very specific it is. So if we took a, I don't know, a, a sugar packet and threw it on the floor, your house would fail every time. Is Dan, that is that serious? Your house would fail every time. A couple follow-up questions. What is the, first of all, is Paragon generally limited to Northeast Ohio or are you serving areas outside of Northeast no, we're, Ohio? Um, because of the size of the company, we service the whole state of Ohio. Okay. So let's say in Northeast Ohio or in the Cleveland, metropolitan Cleveland area, what is the bulk of the uh, remediation or abatement work that you are doing inside a home? Type of work? Typically, yeah. we do a lot of what we consider as component replacement because that's more of a 20-year fix. And I, uh, Stephanie went over that briefly with you guys. There are interim controls, like, for instance, she said, would you rather we paint your house or would you rather have siding? But even siding, there's a process for putting up siding. So Jim can't just go and throw up siding, put the insulation board inside your house. Your house has to be tyvac and then tyvac taped with every seam covered. Every seam gets taped. So even the seams that we put together, they all get taped. The soffit gets taped. The windows get taped and, and, and ran around. So we have to then go inside the actual molding of the windows to tape them to keep them secure so that no lead can escape out of those areas. So it's just not a siding job. There's where the costs come in, but then the house now actually has a 20-year a, a repair or a 20-year fix or shelf life for lead, for lead uh, remediation, not just painting. Because painting, just as Stephanie said before, the kid's playing ball in the backyard. Paint, now the paint job's not what it should be anymore because they've, they've, they've knocked into it or the flaking happens and, and the chipping occurs. And I think the bigger issue is that we're exchanging doors because the biggest problem with lead, in case Anybody's known when you looked at houses for a long time, say they had storms on the houses over the windows. Nobody ever, you know, you don't take the storms off. You always trim around the windows and the house looks good from the outside. But then if you were to lift that window up, you can see all the chippings, all the glazing that was around the windows at the time, all in the bottom. That is loaded, that trough is loaded with lead because they never moved them after the storms. You know what I mean? They never moved anything after the storms. So that's why we do 
tons and tons of component replacement on friction surfaces, so impact surfaces, doors and windows, step treads are huge impact surfaces. So that's one of the things that we change most of the time is component replacement because the county along with other in the state prefer a 20 year kind of a repair than to do interim controls with painting and things like that. Stephanie, how does the referral process generally work? So you show up based on um, a test result that a landlord uh, is hearing about maybe for the first time. Um, you issue an order. What happens um, at that point when you start working with a landlord? Do, do, do you, does the Board of Health provide a list of contractors that do this kind of work, or uh, um, are you in, do you encourage them to visit a particular clearinghouse where that information resides? How does that, how does that work? So first and foremost, we always push our grant. We um, have a commitment to um, housing and urban development to spend $3.2 million and fix a certain number of homes in a three-year period. And so we want to honor that commitment to HUD and fix these homes. So we will always, 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 always push you into our grant. If the tenant has left and it's now a vacant unit, we will still push you into our grant. Um, that's the first thing we're going to do. We're going to push you into a grant so we can spend this money and fix your property. That's the first thing we're going to do. If for whatever reason, and we unfortunately have this situation um, where the tenant doesn't meet the income guidelines, their income is too high, um, then we're going to work with you on finding a contractor. Uh, for our grant, we have seven contractors, licensed, state licensed lead abatement contractors, um, registered with us. And we're going to give you the list of those contractors not saying that they're going to do your job because most of the contractors that are registered with us are also working in the city of Cleveland. They may be working for Summit County. They may be working for the city of Akron. They might be working in Erie County. All these places have lead funding from HUD. So they may not take a private job, but we will give you a list of those contractors and we'll also direct you to the Ohio Department of Health website. Um, because every licensed lead abatement contractor has to be registered with the Ohio Department of Health. Every lead risk assessor, which I am, has to be registered with the Ohio Department of Health. So we'll push you to their website and we'll t walk you through how to use their website. Um, it's really, I tell people to filter it through area code. Um, if you're in Lakewood, I would say 216 and 440 would be the area codes you would filter for. And it's gonna list all the contractors that have stated that they'll work in those, those area codes. Let's, uh, before I go back to Allison, talk numbers. Um, two numbers I think are going to be important to this particular audience. On average, how many times are you um, concerning yourself with a Lakewood rental a year, let's say, the Board of Health? Do you have an idea? Um, so we probably have about 20 children poisoned a year in the city of Lakewood. Um, we probably remediate... Uh, through our grant, not just those homes where the children have been lead poisoned in the home, um, but also those just, you know, of yourself that want to be proactive or you, you know, were talking with someone from Lakewood Over Live and they mentioned our grant. Um, we probably fix about 20, well, our, our grant cycles are three years long. So we probably fix anywhere between 20 and 40 units um, on a three-year cycle in the city of Lakewood. Um, so we, we definitely do single families and um, two and three families. Um, we've done a couple of four units, but not too many. It's usually those single families because the more units you have, the more potential that everyone does not qualify. So everyone has to qualify in a multi-unit. So then that brings us to the second number we're looking for, and maybe Dan can answer this uh, just as well. Give us a ballpark of what those kinds of remediation costs are per unit. Um, any general sense of what that looks like? Let's say that there were no grant funding available. What's expected? I mean, it's difficult to say. I can tell you that um, uh, the County Board of Health have had projects, I would say, Stephanie, as low as $3,200, all the way up to some projects that we've done have been 50,000, one building we did was 280,000, 256,000, right. because it was a 16 unit apartment yeah, building. Just right down the road. Yeah, and then we've done, um, and with the state program, the state funds, I mean, some of their projects are three and $4,000, mm -hmm. 
but a lot of their projects are running into now overruns because they've included another organization through their chip program to help them with some of the lead costs to actually do um, more 20 year repairs, which are ranging now between the high, I think the highest one is about 130,000 and they average probably about 40 to $60,000 a unit with the state program. That's because their, their specs have been writing a little bit larger, but pr primarily here in the city of Cleveland, the county, which um, the Board of Health takes care of the whole county, Cuyahoga County, uh, Erie County, Cleveland Heights has their own program. Um, they're probably range anywhere between 6,000 and 30,000, I think is a good average. And that's based on like single families and two families. All right, Allison, having heard all this, what do you tell all of your constituents out there who are coming to you for advice on housing issues? Um, how does Lakewood Alive get itself involved in this and um, how can you help? I first start off by saying don't panic, number one. These numbers are scary. I'm sure you're all just inside shaking. Uh, but there is a lot of resources. We're very fortunate to live in such a wonderful place. Lakewood, of course. We all drink the Kool-Aid. We love Lakewood. Uh, but Cuyahoga County provides a lot of support. The city of Lakewood has amazing programs available through the Department of Community Development. And Lakewood Alive actually has a program called the Pride Fund uh, to help folks who cannot get conventional bank financing. So there are many, many, many places to turn. So number one, do not panic. Number two, do your homework. Make sure you get multiple estimates. In these types of projects, that's hard to do. They are large projects. Uh, they tend to be more costly when I'm working with someone who's going through the program or has, um, has orders we're seeing anywhere between ten dollars and $15,000 on average for the repair costs. So let's do our homework. Let's ensure that we're getting great estimates from great contractors who we feel good about. I, my mom always says, how does this stomach test? How does your stomach feel? Do you feel good about this? Uh, so let's do our homework, number two. And number three, um, know that you are saving a child's life. That should be number one. You know, you are helping a family raise a healthy and safe child. You yourself are promoting healthy and safe housing. Um, and of course, we want everyone to live in that here in Lakewood. So I am an advocate. I am here to hold your hand. I'm here to be the one that you vent to and say, do you believe what that estimate came back at? Can you believe that? And I will say, oh my gosh, but we still have to do it. So how are we going to accomplish this? Uh, so that's why the city of Lakewood supports Lakewood Alive. I am the one who can hold your hand and spend the time. And I know that the health department does the same thing as well. We will support you every step of the way. I am a lead uh, inspector. I am certified. I've taken tests, uh, that wonderful test. And uh, you can find me on that really difficult website through the Ohio Department of Health. Uh, and so I have a lot of knowledge. And uh, we work, again, very closely with the health department and the city and the building department to ensure that you're getting the right information the first time to ensure that you can get things done, tackle it correctly, um, and then we can move forward with our lives. Again, healthy and safe housing is our number one priority. Thanks. Um, I, uh, we probably need to move on. Dan, do you have one final one more. word? Um, sure. I would tell when you do get a lead order on your home and you don't, you weren't able to go through the county, we under, I'll tell you that you're going to have a difficult time trying to procure a contractor, so please don't get frustrated. I mean, it is a very difficult process for you to do that. The reason why is because um, there are not a lot of contractors that are willing to do it just because of the expense of it. I mean, we have to keep medical records on employees. Each license is um, several hundred dollars for each individual that's on site. There's also continued testing that has to happen. There's a pollution policy that has to go on to several million dollars based on your sales uh, for your business just to do lead abatement. It's not just your general contractor. There's a separate pollution policy you have to have. So there's a lot of costs that are associated with that, and contractors that are available are working. We're working full time primarily for the government entities that we work for, for the, um, for the Board of Health, so they continue to re-up their grant. They have to do so many units. They have benchmarks. They have to hit those benchmarks. Every community has those benchmarks that we work for, and we are the only ones responsible for turning out those units. 
and it's very hard to have a contractor to come out because you don't have a spec and then he's got to come out and write a spec based on your LRA and then he's going to hit you with this number that you like what in the heck because I called so and so and he can fix this stuff for and then it's a waste of the contractor's time but you still have a a, a lead order on your house and it can't be removed until that contractor is is actually procured and the project <coughs> is done so I just want to let you guys know that there are going to be some pitfalls when you guys are trying to find contractors like they won't call you back or they're one is that they're just very busy and two they know that they've not explained the actual cost to homeowners that they're going to incur by going this route with the process Dan you know? thanks very much um, so we'll stop there on the discussion of lead and of course remember you can stick around 830 when we adjourn formally, we'll take some Q&A at that point. If you have burning questions, uh, uh, having heard some of that sobering news, stick around and uh, we'll take your questions at that point. I'd like to welcome to the lectern for a very brief presentation, our Assistant Building Commissioner, Chris Parmalee. He is responsible, Chris is, for um, uh, licensing and permitting uh, in the city. And he's gonna tell you very uh, quickly about the new online portal for getting your uh, annual housing license, and also um, uh, just give you a quick update on our um, uh, inspections as they relate to uh, point of sale. Thanks. Chris, thanks. Do you, wanna, do, you, do you need to take them through it, or can you just tell them about it? I'll just talk okay. about it. That's fine. Uh, new landlords opposed to, who's a new landlord in the city? Anybody? 12 months or less, pretty much. All right. <clears throat> um, so last year was one of the first years that we did housing licenses online, trying to get away from paper, trying to go, get away from our admin staff doing everything up front. Um, so what you'll do, you go on the city website, housing and building. Um, there's drop downs once you get to housing and building. It'll say, uh, I do believe it says register or re-register. When you click that, it's gonna open a window there's gonna be some verbiage, you know, some stuff has changed. All the licenses are due in November now, every one of them. <clears throat> so once you get to that spot, it's gonna say click here. Boom, blue letters, click here. That takes you to our new portal, Citizen Serve. We do all our permitting out of that, inspections. Uh, you can apply for some permits online. They get issued online. There's communication online. It's, it's less phone time for you folks, everybody's busy. So when this portal opens up, just like anything else, Amazon account, whatever, you, you create your username and password. Username's gonna be your email, password is whatever you want your password to be. Try to remember it, but if you forget it for the next calendar year, we can reset it for you. <clears throat> so then you just go through and you fill it out line by line. Anything that has a red line next to it's a required field, asks for basic information, uh, your phone number, property manager phone number. Uh, there has to be a, a responsible party, whether it's yourself or a property <clears throat> manager that we can contact in an emergency. And those housing licenses are back to being post in the front entrance. So that's a little change from the past couple of years. It's a requirement that we found to be necessary. Our fire department likes that, especially in the you know, buildings that carry more tenants get a fire at three o'clock in the morning, they didn't know who to, who to get hold of. Um, so that process, it goes pretty quick. You get through with the license in about 10 minutes, doesn't take much time. The site is semi-mobile friendly, so your iPad, your phone, you can, you can fight through it, but it's better to do it on a PC, to be honest with you. Um, once you finish the application, you get prompted to pay. If you wanna pay with credit card, you could pay through the CitizenServe site. It's secured, you don't have to worry about anything. Uh, we use a third party recipient to take that, to take that money. You can still pay with cash, uh, you could still pay with check. Unfortunately, you can't do check online. You have to do that in office. So you could come in office, you say I wanna pay with check or cash. You wrap up the rest of your license in the office. We have two kiosks set up. Um, anybody could use them anytime they want. <clears throat> We have uh, well, two admin staff up front now that they'll be more than happy to take questions, help you through the process. It's, it's not hard. Our contractors register through this website now too. So all the contractors get registered, put their licensing information and everything in there. So it's kind of to help containerize everything. Uh, 
how many has has anybody got any letters from the building department saying you know changes with housing licenses or due dates or anything like that? Okay, we sent a bunch of mailers out, but I think that all went to condos because that's new for this season. So any you know non-owner occupied condo, there's a, a rental fee associated with that. Uh, just to cover cover another couple things. So if you have a two-family home with a relative living in the house that you know, you're not accepting rent. You can let the building department know that in writing and you will not be charged a housing license. Um, anything, once you hit three family, even if it is owner occupied, you pay a housing license on the units that are not owner occupied. If you have a double and it's owner occupied, you don't need a housing license. And we get a bunch of questions about that every year, but with the show of hands, everybody's pretty familiar with the project and the process and how everything goes. Um, just touch base on inspections real quick. Uh, point of sale inspections, everybody used to call them CFOs. That, that term is in the dumpster. Um, they're certificate of code compliance inspections now. Uh, the mayor signed off on that. Uh, city council passed that. Um, as of Monday of last week, we're doing them again. So if you go to sell a rental property, you're required by city ordinance to get a certificate of code compliance inspection, which is the same exact thing as what we used to call POS's point of sales. Um, for any other inspection, you know, once you guys are landlords, you're, you're, you're on the list for triannual, we'll call them that, inspections. <clears throat> we have four property maintenance inspectors um, that, do, that primarily do the inspections unless there's something technical we have to get involved with. Our job is not to spend your money. Our job is not to make your house a brand new house. We can't do that. We cannot cite out of the building code, the residential code, the mechanical code, the fuel gas, or the plumbing code. We cite out of our local property maintenance code. So essentially what we want you to do is maintain the property in a functional order to be able to you know, help everybody out with property values. I mean, I know all of our taxes are going up, but with what my house just appraised for, I'm not sad. Um, so when we come in, it's uh, top to bottom, inside and out. Uh, you can always request, uh, all, all of our inspectors have, it's a basic check sheet we put together. It's not all inclusive, but that's pretty much what we're looking for. Life safety stuff, um, you know, you get a little bit of seepage in your basement, who doesn't have that? I mean, it's a 110 year old sandstone foundation. Like I said, we're not there to tell you to waterproof your house. You know, we're not there to tell you to replace all your galvanized in the basement with copper. But if, if something's leaking, we expect you to fix it. If the windows broke, <coughs> we expect you to fix it. You know, have carbon monoxide detectors, have, have smoke detectors. Um, it's, it's basic stuff. I mean, it's everything we all have in our own homes that we don't even think about. Um, if you do get sighted, don't freak out. Uh, best thing, I, yeah, I know, right? So best thing you could do is contact your inspector. He or she will be more than happy to spend the time on the phone with you to go over the violations, it's, there's money involved and we understand that. Um, some of these correction notices can get lengthy, but what we'll do is we'll work with you. I mean, if you're moving forward with the corrections that you were given, we will work with you. You know, it's a typical 30 day, everybody goes, oh my God, 30 days, I got all the stuff I gotta do. Don't, like I said, don't panic. Call your inspector, work something out. If you're having an issue with your inspector, call me. I'm gonna leave some business cards up front because after I get done, I gotta, I gotta bail. My kid's birthday tonight. Um, but I wanted to just come speak with you folks. If you have any questions, feel free to call the department, 529-6270, follow the prompts. I'm in the office all day, every day. If you need something, you can call me. So that's all I got, I appreciate it. Thanks, Chris. Yep. Would you stick around for any Q&A or yeah, no? Yeah. Are you able to? Okay, okay. Yeah. all right. Um, Apologize to your uh, birthday child uh, on my behalf. Um, thank you very much. I appreciate that update. Um, our final presentation, formal presentation, and unfortunately his has been truncated quite a bit, uh, is, for, is by Peter Sodek, um, who is the Senior Investigations Coordinator with the, the Fair Housing Center. There's a longer uh, name for that, but that's how they abbreviate their name, the Fair Housing Center. We actually contract with the Fair Housing Center as a city. We have an obligation when we receive that federal uh, housing money, fair, uh, uh, HUD money, to affirmatively further fair housing in 
Lakewood. And one of the ways we do that is to make sure that every year uh, there's sufficient education of our, of our community on fair housing issues. So the Housing Center does uh, both education like this tonight and also seminars around town. They also test for fair housing issues in Lakewood. Uh, and Peter will tell you uh, about the, uh, the ch uh, challenging uh, but interesting world of fair housing tonight. Thanks, Peter. Right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Peter Sadek. I'm with the Fair Housing Center, uh, and I'm an advocate there. My title is uh, Senior Investigations Coordinator. More than anything, I'm an advocate, so I work with folks who call in every day uh, from around primarily Cuyahoga and Lorain County uh, who have report some form of housing discrimination or who have questions about their fair housing rights. I also work with, uh, we work with landlords, housing providers every day as well around the fair housing law to make sure everyone um, can get it right from the get-go. Uh, we have um, an office of about uh, 10 to 12 people. Um, so I'm one of the advocates. We have a handful of advocates who do work in the office. We also have a Department of Education and Outreach, as well as a research team. So uh, I'll just say going forward, we want to be a resource to you all. Um, we hope that you will, will call in if you ever have a question about best practices, um, how to abide by fair housing law. And if you have any questions at all um, when you're renting to tenants, if anything comes up, the tenant situation, anything around a disability-related situation, you're always welcome to give us a call and we would like to be a resource. So I'll, I'll get into um, a bit of our presentation. Uh, I'm not an attorney, so I can't give legal advice, so if there are any uh, questions afterward, I may have to refer you to a HUD guidebook uh, or to an attorney. Um, so I'm going to have to go quickly through some of these slides. Um, this is what we do. We work to eliminate housing discrimination and promote integrated communities. Um, and I told you a little bit about our services. Um, so we're going to go over the properties that are covered under the Fair Housing Act, uh, some of the protected classes, prohibited acts, and best practices. Okay. Uh, don't need to go too much into the history. It was signed into, uh, in 1968, April 11th, the Fair Housing Act came into, into being. Um, they say it's the policy of the U.S. to provide within constitutional limitations for fair housing throughout the United States. And we have uh, federal, state, and local laws. Uh, federal are a bit more uh, constant, and state and local laws are changing. Local laws are changing fairly quickly. We'll get into some of those. Uh, so what are the goals of the Fair Housing Act? To eliminate housing discrimination, reverse decades of effects of discriminatory policies, and to promote residential integration. Why is it important? Uh, it's about accessibility. Um, there are all kinds of uh, studies that come out uh, around access to quality schools, healthy foods, jobs, and health care, depending on where people have the ability to live. So this is a bit of a jargony way of saying what properties are covered. I'm not going to take the time to read that out loud. What this means is essentially this. These are the properties that are covered. House, apartment, condo, manufactured mobile home, nursing home, assisted living, you all can read quicker than, than I can speak. So the, these are the properties that are covered. So if any of you all own any of these properties, it's covered by the Fair Housing Act. Now we'll get into some of the protected classes. So federally, we have the protected classes are race, color, national origin, religion, sex, gender, family, familial status, and disability. Uh, yellow there denotes the state protected classes. So we have ancestry in Ohio as well as military status are two protected classes. Ancestry is a bit more uh, explanatory, uh, self-explanatory. Military status, for example, is that uh, uh, folks who are currently serving in the military, um, let's say they might be deployed overseas, uh, they are protected such that they can break their lease at no penalty. Um, that is a protection that Ohio has added. So here are some additional protected classes. Uh, locally, as you can see, the asterisk there denotes protections in Lakewood's Fair Housing Ordinance. So we have sexual orientation, gender identity, age, marital status, parental status, source of income, creed, ethnic group, occupation, Vietnam or disabled veteran, physical characteristic, and association with a protected class. We'll get into a little bit of the details of each of these. So protection on the basis of sex prohibits discrimination due to uh, these bullet points right here. So uh, uh, Sex-based discrimination is, uh, happens obviously all too, all too commonly. We get calls each day, many days around uh, sex-based discrimination um, in housing, whether that's from a housing provider, a landlord, or a property manager. Um, so we work with folks each day to let them know about their fair housing rights um, or to file a complaint with the Ohio Civil Rights Commission. Um, family status, 
This is how the uh, Fair Housing Act defines what is family status. Someone who's protected is someone who's under 18 living with a parent, a legal custodian or designee, someone who's pregnant, in the process of securing legal custody of someone who's under 18, and this includes foster parenting and adoptions. A common call we might get uh, is by someone, let's say a single mother with children who says, I was told by a landlord, you know, I, I don't rent to, you know, single parents with children, I'm sorry. Right, so that would be a violation of the Fair Housing Act. That's why family status is protected. It was an added uh, protected class in 1980, 1988, I believe, when there were tons and tons of families who were being denied housing left and right because they have children. So these are some of the common violations as I just kind of mentioned. Uh, occupancy codes, there's often a lot of questions about um, how many people are you able to have in, in your dwelling. Um, we always refer people who call to your local uh, city occupancy code because they do vary. Uh, they vary in every city. Uh, generally, many cities will say uh, two heartbeats per room. Um, however, in, in, a, in a large, there are obviously many places with large rooms that you could fit more than two people in. So it's often by the square footage and each city has a different, uh, different standard there. Um, moving on to disability as a protected class. This is how the Fair Housing Act defines disability. Um, Disability-based discrimination is the most commonly reported across the nation. Uh, it accounts for over 50% of all nationwide complaints. Um, we see lots of different kinds of disability-based discrimination and uh, in addition, we wanna make sure that we can work with you all around to make your homes as accessible as possible. Has anyone heard of a reasonable accommodation? Can I see a show of hands? Have, who's heard of that? Okay, great. A reasonable accommodation or a reasonable modification? So we'll get into um, what those are quickly. Um, here are the types of disabilities that are covered. Uh, you get the idea there. I'm also happy to email this PowerPoint to anybody who would like to see it. So we'll get into additional protections. So we just mentioned uh, reasonable accommodations and modifications. An accommodation is a change in a policy or procedure. For example, a building that has a no pets policy, uh, if somebody has a service animal, that would be a change in your no pets policy to allow the service animal because a service animal is not a pet. It is necessary for a person with a disability uh, to level the playing field. Can you ask for documentation, medical verification from a care provider, verifying, verifying the need for this support or service animal? Absolutely. A reasonable modification is a physical change. Uh, so, for example, uh, requesting grab bars be installed in, in a shower to make it safer, right, for a tenant. Um, that's an example of a modification. So an accommodation is a, a change in the policy or procedure, and a modification is a structural alteration to the property to make it more accessible. And, uh, okay, I just gave the definition. There, there it is. <laughs> uh, so these are all examples of, of reasonable accommodations. We call them RAs. Uh, we work with tenants regularly to make these requests. Um, these are all different examples. Change the rent due date. Somebody might receive SSDI-based social security disability income at the, on the 15th of every month, right? And so uh, an accommodation, a change to your policy might be instead of having rent due on the first of every month that you accommodate this person with the disability-based income to make it due on the 15th of each month. That would be an example. Some examples of modifications doorknobs, right, uh, grab bars, as, as I mentioned. Um, and modifications tend to take place, tend to um, be at the tenant's own expense, okay? So if somebody has, uh, they, they need a modification, that can be at the tenant's own expense. Sometimes a landlord wants to install a ramp to make their property more accessible for decades to come. Sometimes they don't, so the tenant, you know, will pay for it. Um, and they can also be responsible for having it removed at the end of their tenancy. These are all examples, as I just mentioned. And as I mentioned as well, uh, the tenant, you can return the property to its original state if you do not want that modification to remain in the unit. New construction, I'm not gonna get into that too much. Most buildings that we deal with and that landlords that we work with um, are all built after, uh, I'm sorry, before 1991. But new construction requirements by the Fair Housing Act apply to all buildings and uh, built after 1991, essentially. 
Uh, these, are, these are some of the bullet points uh, for the new construction features and requirements. Anyone, anyone out there have a property that was built after 1991? Just curious. Okay. All right. That's impressive. 100%. All right. So what are considered some of discriminatory acts? Uh, refusal to, this is based on protected classes. Refusal to sell, rent, negotiate, or otherwise make unavailable or deny dwelling. Discriminate in the terms, conditions, or privileges of a sale. Make, print, or publish any notice statement or ad indicating a preference limitation based on a protected class. Just a few quick examples on, on some of these points. Uh, the second point, discriminate in the terms, conditions, or privileges. Uh, we often see people who go to apply to a home and they might get quoted different amounts of rent or security deposits based on their identity, whether that's disability based, uh, national origin, race. So those are things that we see. Um, make, print, or publish any notice statement or ad indicating a preference or limitation based on protected class. Uh, we recently saw an ad saying, uh, ideal home for Christian tenants. Um, you know, uh, there's all kinds of things that we see every day on Craigslist popping up. So we always say best practice, talk about the property that you have and all the best features, not the people um, that one might desire to have in the unit. Talk about the property, not the people. Um, other examples of what constitutes housing discrimination based on protected classes. Misrepresenting availability, uh, unfairly, right, inequitably. Denying a reasonable accommodation or modification request. Uh, coerce, intimidate, threaten, interfere with, or otherwise retaliate against a person who is exercising their fair housing rights. Okay, um, so the second point, deny a reasonable accommodation or modification request. The key word there is reasonable, right? So what the Fair Housing Act says is that all housing providers must engage in the interactive process. So if you flat out deny without engaging, trying to figure out what might be a reasonable accommodation or modification, that would be seen as a violation of the Fair Housing Act. What is necessary is to engage in the interactive process. Occasionally, um, a specific accommodation or modification may be deemed unreasonable. Um, our advice is to document, document, document. Um, sometimes a request might be made to you verbally, right? Sometimes someone might come and say, uh, you know, I, I, need, I need this accommodation due to my disability, but it might not be in writing. If it's not in writing, you can either ask for it in writing or type it up yourself um, so you have record of dates and times of when that accommodation came in, when you responded, and so on and so forth. So uh, advertising guidelines, already went over that. Um, talk about the property, not the people, refer to housing. Uh, what is not permitted? Uh, these are all examples that we've taken off of Craigslist ads that we've seen over the last few years. Believe it or not, we've seen every single one of these, and they all continue to occur more regularly than you'd think. Uh, so these are all not permitted to put in any advertising. Some of the emerging issues. Um, on September 25th, 2018, Cuyahoga County passed an anti-discrimination ordinance. Uh, it became the first in the state to adopt legislation to add protections for the LGBTQ plus community. And this uh, applies across all 59 municipalities in, in the county. Okay. HUD guidance on criminal background screening. Has anybody heard of the new HUD guidance that came out, well, new, 2016, a few years ago? Uh, they essentially acknowledged uh, that about one in three people in the U.S. have some type of criminal background. And so if everyone was denied housing who had a criminal background, it may get to the point where one in three people do not have an opportunity to, to live in a home. And so they came out and they said blanket bans can have a disparate impact based on the racial makeup of who is in prison. Um, and so they essentially say if you have, for example, no felonies accepted, based on the dispro disproportionate amount of people of color who are in prison today or jail in the US, if you say no felonies, that will have a disproportionate impact on primarily African American and Latino people. And so they ask for you to work with people on a case by case basis to determine uh, people's criminal background as far as what's acceptable, acceptable to have in your property. Um, so must 
the HUD guidance says you must evaluate applicants' backgrounds by case-by-case -case basis. Like I said, must consider the severity of the crime and the length of time since the crime was committed. To deny, you must be able to prove through reliable evidence that the criminal history makes housing that applicant a risk for other tenants. There's plenty of HUD uh, guidance that s talks about their kind of specifics about what is deemed someone who may be a risk or pose danger to other tenants, okay? Um, thank you. All right. Um, other uh, kind of emerging issues, criminal activity nuisance ordinances. There's been a lot of articles um, recently so, uh, around some cities in Cuyahoga County. Um, this essentially uh, takes, um, it basically comes out in, in when uh, current tenants are, might have to call the police regularly, and then the police find the, the homeowner of that property, and so the property, uh, the homeowner is forced to evict those tenants because they're getting fined. Most times, it's usually a victim of domestic violence who's having to contact police regularly, and they are often the ones who are most often targeted by these criminal activity nuisance ordinances because they are the ones who are most often evicted. Um, so there's a few different articles. I'm happy to send them out. If anyone's interested, I can send you some more information on these. Uh, so consequences of violating the laws, uh, pretty self-explanatory. There's lawsuits, <laughs> investigations, damages, uh, suspension or loss of real estate license. Of following the laws, one can be a force for good, avoid unnecessary fines, penalties, or lawsuits, personal satisfaction of complying with the law and promoting everyone's right to equal housing opportunity. So as we often say, uh, one's housing stability is often predictive of, of often the rest of one's uh, stability in many different facets of, of their lives. And so housing is a foundation for, for so many uh, aspects of people's lives, um, as you all know. And so here's a little bit of a list of our best practices. Design a checklist of rental criteria. I'm not going to read all of these. Uh, select the first person that meets the checklist criteria, right? If you get 10 applicants, to avoid any questions of why you chose this applicant A over applicant C or D, um, our best practice we advise is to pick the first one that comes into your hand that fits all the, the criteria that you have uh, for your rental property, OK? Uh, engage in the interactive process whenever an accommodation or modification is requested. And if you want to get involved, we're on social media. We regularly um, share articles that might be helpful to housing providers. Again, we want to be here as a resource. Um, so you're always welcome to give us a call if you have any question whatsoever about uh, you know, a, a tenant um, or about your own practice or about your rental application. Um, we're happy to look it over and get back to you. So thank you very much for your time. And I'll be here after. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And thanks to all of our uh, terrific uh, speakers tonight. We are formally uh, at the moment of adjournment. So, um, I, but I know, well, I assume based on all of our uh, 22 other or 21 other landlord seminars, there will be folks in this room with questions, good questions. And I would say that even if you don't have a question, you may stand to benefit from hearing the answers to some of your colleagues' uh, questions as well. So I'd encourage you, as many of you who'd like to stick around to do so, if you are planning on leaving, please just do so quietly right now, and we'll hold off on questions. Everyone, please remain seated. Who is going to stay? We will uh, just take your questions one by one as you raise your hands, OK? So let's give it just a minute or so. Peter, quick question, as these folks are uh, uh, heading out and the re remaining landlords are staying. Um, the question I've got, uh, uh, sorry, Peter. The question I've got is, is the Fair Housing Center doing testing around the issue of um, criminal background checks and uh, landlords using uh, criminal backgrounds? I, it's a relative. It's relatively new HUD guidance, so right. uh, or DOJ guidance. Um, so, is the Fair Housing Center uh, actually testing for that yet? And and are you finding that there's there's mm -hmm. administrative or litigation action uh, around that issue? 
So we are not actively testing on that yet um, because our grant funding does not yet provide for that type of testing. However, when, uh, when there are tests conducted, oftentimes rental applications are collected, and so we will flag applications that may have uh, you know, extremely strict criminal backgrounds to kind of keep track of them to see what are kind of standard rental applications across the board and which ones um, might going forward uh, appear a violation um, to the Fair Housing Act. Okay, thanks. And you know Lakewood offers a discount tenant screening program where you get a, a checkout code. Uh, and we've negotiated with a, a large national vendor that does background checks. Um, um, of course, the intentions are that we, you know, give you all the tools you need to make good decisions on who you rent to. Um, we, we have gotten a little flack for that, um, um, and I think it has more to do with the vendor that we've chosen because I think there's been some uh, concern in, over that vendor's behavior historically. Um, we haven't changed our, our position on it yet, but of course it's a live issue, and um, you know, we know um, it's, not, it's, it's, it's perilous for you to base your decisions on maybe one of those criteria, uh, criteria, you know, such as a background check, so. All right, uh, let's start taking questions. How about we'll start in the, in the second row? Yes, sir. Nuisance ordinances? Right. So Lakewood, the, if I'm fairly characterizing your question, you're wondering, um, you know, and, and how do we achieve that balance between a, a landlord's responsibility to not violate fair housing laws and a landlord's responsibility to know what's going on at the landlord's property, right? Um, yeah, we take that seriously. We've got a criminal activities nuisance ordinance. It's on the books. I don't know if any of you have ever received a, a notification under that ordinance, but um, we use it sparingly. Uh, we historically had used it, uh, I think, more frequently than we do these days. But um, the overarching intent of our ordinance is to make sure that landlords at least know what's going on on a property if that behavior is uh, turned out to be challenging for the neighborhood. So uh, oftentimes they're not going to hear that information, from, certainly not from their tenants. And if they don't have a direct connection with either neighboring tenants or owners, they're not going to hear that information. So we use that code generally to place landlords on notice, give them a warning um, that if additional activity occurs, which draws our police personnel usually to the property, they could get uh, assessed the cost of that response from the police. That, uh, it, we do not require that landlords evict their tenants. Sometimes that happens as a result of those letters, those warning letters, but not always. Um, sometimes landlords at least can have a conversation with those tenants, particularly if the behavior is a little more benign, like loud music or something like that, as opposed to um, you know, a, a felony or some sort of more serious crime on the property. <clears throat> you know, I, I'm, I'm the appeals offer, uh, officer on these issues. I would say we're looking for repeat conditions. When, uh, when something like that happens, it, it happens. We're all on the same team to protect the neighborhoods and the, the neighbors. But if you have, if that happened repeatedly, uh, <clears throat> do your, yeah. I mean, it can well, only, the, the it point only is it has to happen three times. three times. That's right, to make a nuisance. Three times within a 12-month period, same, same incident. So that's a nuisance. So that's where we talk a little more sternly. But the fact is, stuff does happen. We are all interested in working together. But if it happens again and again and again, that's a different conversation. I think you probably can appreciate that. <clears throat> all right. Uh, one time is enough for something. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, red shirt, yes. Yeah, absolutely. So what he or she would do is um, meet with whoever their inspector is. Uh, we have a document. It's called the acknowledgement form. They essentially, we, what, what the inspector does is, you know, label the current violations that weren't abated uh, because usually there's some sort of deal between seller and buyer. Hey, I'll do this, but not that kind of deal. Um, so that they would sign an acknowledgement form. That's why we don't do escrow. We don't want your money. We want you to fix the house. I mean, essentially. So, so that acknowledgement form gets gets the worm on the hook to to make sure that gets fixed. Um, and that's based seasonally too. Like, say, say you buy a property. I don't know. It's like late October. The place needs a paint job and a roof. We're realistic. We will follow up with you in the spring. Like I said before, I mean, we we want to work with you. And we all want the same end result. We, we don't want to fight. And the last thing we want to do is take somebody to court. Yes, ma'am, in the back row. No, actually, it went, uh, I do believe it was April. Kevin, right? When well, the, the ordinance became the ordinance became effective. We need to do because we revised some of our procedures. We needed some time to get our forms back in order and um, uh, in the program up and running. So there was a period of suspension where we were not doing point of sale inspections. No one is going to be on the hook for no. properties transferring within that period of time. Yeah, but I mean, we are now would... doing point of sale inspections again. So I mean it. it Essentially, it's like two weeks ago. So, I mean, it, if, if you had something, that you, you had a deal in the works a month ago, I mean, we're not, it's not, we're not coming after you. You know, it's pretty much, we just want to, trying to get the word out. I mean, I know the mayor's office was putting some, some things on social media. It's going on the mailers. It's going to be on the back of the water bill. Um, we have some language on the website about it. You know, like I said, if anybody has any questions, I mean, we have a full staff that can answer just about everything. No, it was it started last October. I mean, that that was a pretty important tool we had. I mean, even for commercial storefronts, but it's it's back now, and you know, it it will be enforced. Second row, yes. That's in Lakewood. It's just in Lakewood alone. Right. So we remediate. So, Stephanie, could you just sort of uh, maybe repeat the oh. question? So the, the question was, if you didn't hear, he was um, asking about the grant and how many properties we fix over a course of a three-year period. Um, and so, um, you know, we're looking at 225 properties over a three-year period. Um, a significant amount of properties are in the city of Lakewood, the city of Cleveland Heights, um, those are where we, in East Cleveland, those three communities, we have a lot of participation in. And then, you know, we're focusing on the other first ring suburbs, you know, Euclid, Maple Heights, Garfield Heights, you know, those communities, South Euclid as well. So we... Ohio, no, for Cuyahoga County. Okay. For Cuyahoga County. Cuyahoga so County, city, but not Cleveland because right, it has its own Right, the city of Cleveland has its own health department, and they have their own Department of Community Development, which also has HUD funding. And so when Dan mentioned that, you know, it's sometimes hard to find a contractor, it's oftentimes because they're already working for the Board of Health, they're working for the city of Cleveland's grant, they're working for Akron's grant, they're working for the Summit County Health Department's grant, Erie County's grant, Mahoney County's grant, the state of Ohio's grant. So Ohio has been very fortunate in receiving a lot of HUD funding um, to fix lead hazards. So um, yeah, 3.2 million over the course of three years for roughly 225 homes. Yes, uh, you know what, I, what I'd say is that generally on HUD guidance, um, the uh, the charges that that you'd think that would be that they'd consider as you know a threat to other tenants, 
are all exactly like kind of the most common felonies that we think of as far as when we deem people a, a threat to other tenants in the building. Um, you know, HUD's effort is to make it, is to put people in the same room to discuss what happened because of how many felonies they were finding that um, may have been uh, downgraded at a later time um, or, you know, it's been 25 years, it dealt with possession and addiction, a disability from many years ago. Um, so that's kind of where that new guidance is coming from. It's, it's about, you know, trying to understand the, the length and severity of each crime, essentially. Um, and just an example that we get calls regularly with, from people who have even misdemeanors from 35 years ago who are denied from pretty much every, who didn't even have an arrest record, um, who are denied from most places because of their specific criminal background check. So just an example of the other, under, other end of the spectrum, but um, happy to talk about you know, specifics whenever a tenant comes up with a type of felony, sure. Yes, sir. Yes, we can give up to three 90-day extensions. So technically under the letter of the law, you have 360 days to come into compliance. Um, if, you know, and, and we're the, the enforcement arm for the Ohio Department of Health, and if, you know, on day 350, you finally get a contractor in there and it's gonna take 15 days, yes, we're going to work with you. As long as you are making progress and moving forward, we're going to, to give you every opportunity to correct it. If you are blatantly ignoring us, um, and we'll, we'll do everything we can. We'll bring you in for an informal hearing in our office and, and kind of lay everything out on the table to find out where you're at, what opportunities you have to correct it. So we're gonna work with you for the whole process. The last thing we want to do is cause people to move out of their home and have to seek alternate housing because of the lead hazards. We want to see these homes fixed as the city of Lakewood wants to see these homes fixed so they're safe places for families to live. they are responsible for finding alternate housing. We do work with, pardon me? That's between you and the tenant. We have nothing to do with that. All we can do is enforce what's under the letter of the law under Ohio Revised and Administrative Code. Um, so that that part of it, if they choose to you know, hire an attorney to, you know, to, to protect their rights, we, we, we have no part in it. We will disclose all documents and everything like that, but we don't have anything to do with it. Most likely you're responsible. It's your property and you fail to maintain it in a safe and you know, secure way. Um, so again, we don't get involved in the prosecution end of it. So if they choose to, to move forward with that, that's their choice. If they do have, um, if they are low income and they, there are funds in the county available, they're called prevention, retention, and contingency funds, PRC dollars. Um, we'll direct them there to see if, if they need assistance in moving and finding alternate housing. So we'll direct them there. Stephanie, on that point, um, um, have you heard that tenants have the um, ability to, to claim maybe constructive eviction or break a lease because of these orders? Uh, so anecdotally, Yes, what are you we've, hearing we've had that? some of them. Tenants you know, can basically leave if they get elevated blood levels and if, you find if, that there's testing in the home that... Uh, if they are utilizing vouchers, um, which it doesn't sound like too many Lakewood residents do, but if they are utilizing vouchers, um, you know, CMHA will, will have them leave. They, they will counsel, counsel their voucher um, because they won't allow any other tenants to be living in a home where there are known lead hazards. How about in a private lease situation? In a private lease Which situation. Which probably what most of these folks Right. Have. We have had residents that have, you know, sought assistance in terminating their lease um, because they no longer want to be in a home where their child is at risk of further lead poisoning. Um, it is a, a health and safety issue for many parents, and they will they will terminate their lease on that. So basis. to to this man's point, if the if if let's say everybody agrees to walk away and the tenants leave, does that ninety day or yes, uh, three hundred sixty day tick uh, ticker right. stop 
No. Ticking? The orders are on the property. They are not associated with the family. They are on the property. So like I said earlier, we can't stop the sale of a property. Um, that would take a court action. So we can't stop the sale of the property. Um, but we can put notice on the property, that affidavit, that there are these lead hazards, that it should not be occupied by anyone. But again, even if the tenant leaves, if we can still get you into the grant, we're going to, I mean, I, I know I sound like a broken record, we're going to push the grant. We are going to push as hard as possible to give you eight to $10,000 to fix your property. Um, Thanks. Yes? Do you have the tools available that I can clean up lead dust in my house? No. <laughs> yes, um, so everyone, this is John Sobolewski. This is um, one of the supervisors at the Cuyahoga County Board of Health. He is my boss. Um, so yes, we do have a question. high efficiency particulate vacuum available, a HEPA vacuum, that you may borrow for free for two weeks. Um, it's a free service that we recommend if you are doing any work in your home um, prior to a tenant moving in or if, like we talked about earlier, if you have to do something because there's a plumbing leak or whatever and you're containing it and you want to do proper cleanup, I would recommend that you call our office to borrow one of these vacuums. You borrow it for two weeks, you return it dirty. I get the luxury of cleaning it once you return it um, prior to it being loaned out to somebody else. So you can borrow it for free of charge. Um, we do restrict it to properties in Cuyahoga County. Um, so please don't take it home to your property if you live in Lorraine um, because the city, of, uh, Lorraine County has their own loan program. Uh, Allison also can respond to that. Uh, so Lakewood Alive has just started the Lakewood Toolbox. It's a tool lending library. It's very exciting. It's uh, housed in a shipping container at the screw factory, lakewoodalive.org slash toolbox. Uh, and we are in the process of also securing HEPA vacuums uh, that can be lent through the toolbox as well. Thanks. Uh, before I return to someone uh, who's asked a question, yes. Uh, the certificate of liability insurance, I do believe it's a hard field now. It's required. Um, you just you upload the electronic document. It gets saved to the file. Um, the system doesn't know what you upload, to be honest with you. So, I mean, it could be a picture of Mickey Mouse. <laughs> but we do, we, we, we do manual audits on the documents periodically. So, yeah. Yep. No, it's... Uh, it, so this, this, I personally worked on this housing module for about six months to get it to where it is now. Um, still dialing it in a little bit, uh, but between conversations with law, um, our fire department, there's, there's some new fields you folks aren't gonna recognize that, that are gonna be new. And if you have any questions about it, like I said, don't hesitate to ask. Um, but anything that does have a red line next to it is a required field. And like one, one, of the, one of the changes is actually posting that housing license again because for the past, I don't know, what, four or five years, uh, it's you know, been, oh, you don't have to post it anymore. But we do request that it be posted visible, you know, whether it be in a common hall or you know, vestibule or what have you. Uh, yes. I would say 80% or more. 80%. And Lakewood would be higher. We're not saying that. We're, we're talking about properties what, that haven't had any improvements to them at all. Um, if you think about a lot of homes, um, have had window replacement, have had door replacement, have had aluminum or vinyl siding put on them. So not every property that was built before 1978 is still considered a hazard. Um, and you're also talking that there are not children less than five years of age living in all of these properties. So we're really concerned about the properties uh, where they have not had any improvements done to them and their rental properties because you have a high turnover of tenants and the potential of having a small child in that property is greater. So we're really focusing on those houses. So your inner ring suburbs um, have the older housing stock in them. How did we all manage to reach an old age? Well, right, congratulations I'll... on that, but there, there are a couple of different things. Um, 
One, every child has different behaviors. So every child's mouthing behaviors are different. Um, and also, the paint that's on the homes are now in deteriorated condition. So when you were in a home, the paint on that home, you know, whenever it was, I don't want to guess at your age, but it may have been newer paint in intact condition. Now we have had so many layers of paint put on top of it, and lead was put into paint because it allowed that paint to expand and contract. And it only does that for so long before it literally just breaks. It can no longer do that. And the only way to address that damaged paint is to either remove it or encapsulate it, you know, enclose it with siding or something like that. So, um, no, we all had lead-based paint in our surroundings when we were growing up, be it on our crib or our home, but every child is different and the condition of the paint is different and has aged horribly, unfortunately. Uh, right, uh, we'll, we'll, uh, actually, yes. Chris, do you want to answer that? Yeah, I got it. Uh, every, every contractor does need to be licensed uh, through the city of Lakewood. We, we don't require a bond, but we do require uh, he or she to be, uh, they have to have the city of Lakewood as uh, additionally assured, insured on their insurance paperwork. Um, it, well, <laughs> the the... The past, the past four years, it's been really hard to find anybody to do anything. I mean, we got a, a bunch of local contractors. Um, last November, they were booked up through September of this year. So, I mean, if you find somebody, you got to throw down a deposit. It's just, it's, it's tough. And, and it usually, if, if the, what I always tell everybody is if, if, if you have somebody coming to you um, and the price seems a extremely cheap, I'd turn your back. That's not what they're demanding. What they're really saying is about lack of people. Either right. Either no one is like, I called you in Paris concrete, but... Uh, nobody, nobody called you back? Yeah. See, I mean, we're, we're, not, we're not vested with any of those contractors. That list is just to provide you folks with, with people that are insured to work in the city. That doesn't mean if somebody's not on the list, they can't work here. Right. Um, but typically... Contractors aren't going to go around to every municipality and pay the hundred or hundred and fifty dollars it is a year. You know they're not going to they're not going to come here unless they sell a job. Um, but but there is we we can't recommend anybody. I'm not going to lie and say I haven't dropped the pen on five contractors all at once. You know that to, to call to narrow it down because that list can get extremely lengthy, especially the way things have been the past you know four or five years. But for somebody not to call you back, I mean. It's a drag, it really is, and, and, but there's nothing I can help you with. Um, feel free to call any contractor, ask around, um, and be weary about the people that don't want to register in Lakewood. I mean, because you, you can't drive down a street in the city without a white van doing something at somebody's house. Allison. So my job, and we may have spoken, I don't know, you look familiar, uh, but uh, so my job, honestly, is to help you find contractors. Uh, I don't recommend people for the people watching at home, but I would only give you a name of a contractor that I would hire at my own house. Uh, so I know the struggle, it, the struggle is real. Uh, there's so much work happening in this city as Chris has talked about. So please call Lakewood Alive, call me, Allison Urbanic. Uh, email me, uh, I'd like to help you find contractors. Absolutely. I'm going to try to get folks who haven't had their questions answered just yet, and then we'll return to those who uh, have. That's fine. It's a rental unit, so they don't have to have children in the home. They still have to meet the income guidelines for a, a, a household. So even if they aren't related, that household still has to meet the income guidelines. Uh, again, like I said, the reason for rental units not having to have children because we know the potential for the high turnover and a child potentially coming into the home. And then behind you, sir, on the end.
favor of the landlord? So it's not a judgment. Um, so there is no ruling. So the way so the way it works is when the child has a blood lead test done, they list the address that they currently reside at. So that's the address we go and inspect first. And if we find that there are lead hazards in that property, then we issue orders. We have in some cases found that there are no lead hazards. So we have to look at alternate sources. It could be something that the child is consuming. With a lot of our um, refugee families and foreign families, they are consuming products. And that's where the hazards are coming from. And if it's something like that, then no, we cannot cite the property. We cannot issue orders if it's something like that. If it is a case in which there are no environmental hazards, meaning property hazards, and there are no um, other hazards in the home, we can then look at the previous address if necessary. Um, but our first step is to assess the property in which the child is living at the time that they got the blood draw done. Um, no. Um, probably 90-10, yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Maybe yes. Potentially, yes. <laughs> no, because we do get... We don't cite them. If, it, it, if, right, it is, it is because of some, um, some other thing in the home and not the structure of the home. So, yes. Yes. If you're, if you're making a point, I'll ask you to wait. If you're asking a question, feel free to ask your question. Okay, because okay. I want to make sure we get to all the questions. All right, in the red shirt, uh, you're, you're next. Stephanie, you're talking mostly about kids. Do adult, can adults get lead poisoning? For example, I've got a landlord for 42 years. They need to outside. Yes, there is that potential. And you wouldn't know it until you had a lead test done. Um, and so if there are any um, landlords in here, I'm looking to you, and, um, and you're doing work in your home, and you are of childbearing age, before you have children, you may yourself want to have a lead test done. Um, the, the hazards are different for an adult. You can, ex you can have a higher lead level than a child can, and the, um, the, the detriments to your body are different as well. So it's not going to cause a neurological damage. It's going to cause high blood pressure, you know, reproductive issues, things like that. Um, but whereas a, an elevated lead level in a child less than six years of age is 10, um, the standard is from OSHA, and it's 40. So it's a much higher level than an adult. But if you're, if you're someone that's doing a lot of work in an older home, um, if you um, go to a, a shooting range, um, and things like that, you know, or you work um, in, in, you know, manufacturing, it would be wise to have a lead test done. It's a simple blood draw. Okay, two more yeah. questions. Kevin, Wait. Kevin, can I just add a point there? Sure. Our Human Services Department is launching an education initiative for our young families to look at the child's nutrition. One thing we've learned is a child that has calcium deficiency has a greater chance of absorbing lead than one that doesn't. So we would want a child in Lakewood to be aware, and a parent be aware <clears throat> of that nutrition and make sure that calcium is not a deficiency. So whatever place they might be exposed to in their lives as a young kid, they're much more resilient if they don't have these vulnerabilities. So there are many other factors that we would want to approach in terms of making Lakewood lead safe. So the physical place for sure, but the family and the, how they eat and how they behave are also components. It's a complicated world. The city certainly is going to be, at least at the very least, an educational partner in all this. So, um, and that's uh, an effort that's uh, underway, as the mayor indicates. White, white shirt, and then green, and then I think we'll let uh, this gentleman make his point, and then we'll adjourn. They have to be in the home six weeks. Green shirt, second row. Rawson, you were talking about replacement of the board, and that's a 20 year fix and such like that. I don't understand if you replace the door, you've taken the load away. How does that recreate after 20 years that you're going to have to do something else with lead? On that, in that Everybody hear the question? Saying, um, if you're asking me why, how is it a 20-year fix for the door? Well, you're saying or, the door is a 20-year fix 
Yeah, the door, that what they consider, the HUD gives a guideline of what they consider interim control, and let's say for a map's sake, a long-lasting uh, permanent control or permanent uh, replacement for something that is no longer an issue anymore. So we know, and the state knows, and that component replacement is our only best avenue for that to happen. Because we can't demolish your whole house and rebuild it. So we know that friction controls, doors, windows, thresholds, uh, floors are definitely impact surfaces and um, friction control surfaces. So we know if we change those components, the chances of you developing lead <coughs> in those high areas, don't mean you're not gonna develop lead from anywhere else. So if the kid is playing hockey in the living room and he's not, the puck's knocking plaster off the wall, well now we still have a lead hazard. It doesn't, it doesn't change that. But it does change the fact that we know every day you're going to open and close the door and you're going to slam it. We know a good chance you're going to lift your windows up and down every day. Those are all friction controls. And once we change those components, we know it's a more permanent repair or permanent, more permanent remediation than if we go in and just take the window apart and try to sand it and then paint it and put it back for you. Once it's there, that's, that's more than a 20 year fix, though. Could be, yeah. Twice. But they just deem that as what they consider. Right, because the likelihood of a window lasting 20 years, yes. that's that's right. the lifespan of a window, to, you know, so you may have to replace that window after 20 years. Okay. We're, oh, I know, All right. I know. All right, know. we'll do one more question. That's it. Go ahead. Uh, I'm not aware of one. Uh, the, you may have friends here. Uh, are you buying tonight? <laughs> uh, but there is no formal network. Uh, but um, I would say um, maybe Chris could be an arbiter. If you have an issue, he might know of other landlords who have dealt with it. He'd be happy to maybe make that contact. Yeah, there isn't an association. You might want to check Chamber of Commerce and see if there's a subset of the chamber that uh, is exclusively property owners. Maybe, maybe you could start one. Yeah. We have, we've have heard that, that folks have been interested in doing that, but it hasn't come to fruition. I came from yeah. a building salvage uh, company that uh, had a retail store and looked maybe do something like that here, too. Right. Traditionally... Traditionally, you guys get most organized when our city council or the mayor proposes, and I'm not saying this mayor, any mayor, uh, proposes something that infuriates you. So <laughs> that's right. Uh, all right. Uh, okay, the advocate for the devil. I I can't I can't respond to that I you know not in my role. Well, the only thing I would qualify to that, and I know I remember Don, you and I first met over a similar circumstance with your tenant, and it was a tough situation uh, where we had a tenant that was fairly violent, uh, and it was uh, we worked together on that, <clears throat> and our police were involved, uh, but I think the important thing there was that was not a child, so I think our primary concern, if I'm not mistaken, is basically someone who's zero to six years old, zero months to six years old. That's our greatest vulnerability here, and that's what we really want to protect. All right, 
some sobering news tonight, but good questions. Thanks very much. Thanks for sticking around afterward. Um, two quick plugs. One, that guy's got the best T-shirt. Makes me want to go drink a beer. Uh, it says, drink Wisconsinably. Uh, and uh, Patsy Donovan here in the front row, she makes the best Irish soda bread. Um, try to pry the recipe out of her if you can. That's it. Thanks very much. Good night. <laughs>